I think we all love that thought that we could be self-sustaining in everything that we do, right? I mean, there's a part of all of us maybe that imagines a world that of which we have total control, um, or at least maybe total control is the wrong way to look at it. Complete participation, where everything about our life is um, is something in which we are totally immersed, where we're not consumers of what other people do in order to sustain us, but we are self-sustaining. And to some people, that's, you know, about staying off the grid. Other people, it's uh, it's about not being dependent on uh, any type of government program or just, you know, n- not just sort of being able to say proudly that I did that myself. Uh, and yet, if we're going to take that to a more, a further edge, uh, then we can find that some of the most interesting work that's being done, I think, in that uh, in that field is in the field of farming and, and self-sustaining farming. And, and how much property does one need? Uh, what is the secret to being successful with it? Whether you're working in a family or a small group, can you be a part of a food production system um, which would leave you uh, independent of, say, you know, commercial sales um, where you could grow your own food, grow your, you know, have your own eggs, uh, create your own self-sustaining uh, family environment that you're, you know, would be something that, that generations might benefit from your planning right now. But how do you do that? Uh, well, there is a DVD tutorial that covers the basics of food production systems. You can link up to Marjorie Wildcraft's Backyard Food Production dot com website by going to coast to coast am dot com. But it it is trickier, perhaps, than just saying get a piece of land and start planting. Uh, and that's why we've got her coming up next, and we'll get to that question eventually. On do you need a gun to garden? Coming up on Coast to Coast. This is Ian Punnett. Well, seemingly, Marjorie Wildcraft would have the perfect name uh, to be involved in this kind of wildcraft that she's working on out there in the middle of central Texas. Um, Or is that just a a stage name, Marjorie? It's just a stage name. (laughs) Okay. Uh, But the the farm itself is real. And you and your husband and your kids, uh, uh, this isn't an imaginary sort of... Facebook Farmville thing. You're living it, right? We we are living it. About half of my diet comes directly from the land, and um, I do more. But the reality of of a modern lifestyle re- requires that you know I'm not going to do it all, and also we're not getting the kids to work nearly as much as I would like to. <laughs> uh, well, like you and every other parent. Uh, exactly. But the uh, but your the the family farm concept obviously been around. You know, since eternity, this was a, the the belief that originally is, is this was the margin between life and death was being able to have food and be able to create a, a buffer to be able to save some, start putting away food for for times of drought or or famine and 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 you've you you're doing a lot of things which some people imagine both they want to do sometime in their life, but also some people imagine they could never do, even though it's probably a lot simpler than some of us think it is. You know, like a lot of things, it's it's simple, but not necessarily easy. But I'd also like to say, you know, the last 50 or 60, maybe the last two or three generations where we have not had to be involved directly in our own food production has been a, an incredible anomaly in the in the in the if you look back at human history and in fact for any any animal or any species on the planet you know growing food finding food being involved with with getting the the nutrients and the energy that you need is con- usually a significant part of your daily activities so for a modern person to only have to whip into McDonald's or something and grab and go and not have to be involved in that whole process is is just a huge anomaly it's, and it's amazing now that almost nobody is involved with it you know, back in the, it was as recent as I think it's the 1940s or 50s. I can't remember the what the cutoff date, but at one point, the majority of Americans had either grown up on a farm or were one generation removed from a farm. And now that number is obviously dwindled to a much lower percentage of Americans that ha- that ever have spent time at a farm or know anybody who has. 
you're, it's amazing that these skills have been lost in, in basically two generations. My husband's grandmother had an acre garden, and, and she grew food not only for her family, but for a bunch of the neighborhood. And they knew. I mean, she grew up knowing how to do it from her parents and her grandparents. But my parents and, and me, and we, we were interested in, in cars and television and university and, and um, you know, walked away from a lot of that because food was so available and plentiful and cheap and, and, and not necessarily something to, to be involved with. You know, if you want a lens on that, I always thought it's interesting. If you go back to the um, Warner Brothers cartoons, like the Looney Tunes cartoons, then the the number of those cartoons that take place on a farm or have something to do with farming, it's completely anomalous now with what cartoons would be around today. But at the time, um, the average person totally related to it, and they got the jokes, they got the farming jokes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it's way the so. so I, I think this is a good movement to be thinking about going back to whether it's self sustaining water power. Um, even obviously waste removal is a part of that process, whether people want to get into it or not. And then growing your own food, growing, you know, raising your own meat, protein, whatever you're going to do, you can do it, but you got to be kind of, you got to start getting dedicated to it because this isn't going to, it's not going to come easily. As you said, I mean, there's, there's got to be some sacrifices that people are going to be willing to make and disconnecting a little bit from the traditional way that American life has led us all to go, including you. At one point, you and your husband were both, what, in business, and what was the other career that you all came from? We started out as engineers. And, uh, That's I right. Had always, yeah, I'd had a passion for, for making money, and then we got into real estate investment. And, uh, yeah, so I had a whole, you know, uh, corporate um, business-type background and, and nothing really to do with growing food. It, it grew up in a, you know, suburban environment, not not really at all involved in, in growing food. So it's been a major life change. Uh, and one, I must say, much for the better. I'm, I'm totally happy about it, although at times well, good. it's very difficult. Well, yeah. well, I'd hate a DVD of how bad your life is. That wouldn't be any fun for us to... <laughs> No, not at all. Who would want that? Come get a DVD of how you can take your life from something joyful into something miserable. No thanks. Uh, but but well, you can get a DVD tutorial about covering the basics of this life shift here, and you can link up to uh, Marjorie by going to coast to coast am uh, dot com. But so you and your husband both. Um, left your corporate worlds after a certain point and you decided to get into self-sustaining farming. Why did you choose kind of a difficult place to do that in? It's, 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 a, it's a really big life shift and, and a big life shift often doesn't come without a big crisis. And we'd, we'd been fairly successful in the real estate business and um, you know, a small, you know, it was obviously a small mom and pop type business, but we were making a, a pretty decent income. And I was always interested in the money flows. You know, where we, you know, we were, man- if you're going to be successful in real estate, you're going to be managing debt. And we, we sure. were managing, I mean, you know, six to eight million dollars worth of mortgages. And I was always interested in where that came from and traced it back to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And then when I understood their business models, I said, oh, my God, uh, they're going to implode. And when they do, they're going to take down the real estate market. They're going to take down the banks, the insurance companies, the major employers, the retirement funds, the U.S. economy, and then the global economy. And we could see that the whole thing would topple. And at that time, and I, and I still feel this is a very good possibility, uh, there's the very strong possibility of societal collapse, certainly commercial collapse and economic collapse. And and really, I mean, I was shaken, uh, panicked, and very deeply concerned about how, you know, I mean, I'm looking around at the world around me, and there's only four days' worth of food supply in the grocery stores. Right. And the, and the food travels to us on an average of 1,500 miles. So th- there's this just-in-time trucking system that, if anything, nothing has failed in that so far, but the potential for it. And when you start right. getting into this, it it shocked me so deeply. And I said, you know, we've got to completely restructure our lives and look at what are some of the most important things. What are some of the most fundamentals and water, food, you know, shelter. And so I began the journey of uh, we, we, you know, dismantled the real estate uh, business. And I began looking at 
what are the most efficient ways to grow food and what are the simplest ways to grow food and, and just how much can you do it on a balcony? No, but do you need 100 acres? No, you know, what? how much land do you need? You know, could an average family grow all of what they need? Could they at least grow half of what they need? Could, you know, what does it take to do that and how much time? And we, we're not, I'm not the type of person to think about these things. Like, let's go do this. Let's put stuff in the ground and let's experiment with this and let's find out what works and what doesn't work. Um, and actually, the failures, uh, we've had quite a few. <laughs> We put those into the tutorial, and a lot of people have told us, you know, actually that's the thing we get the most, most helpful part. For. Right. Uh, yeah, four days of food in the supermarkets. That's if you don't have teenagers, by the way. <laughs> that is, yeah. It yeah. becomes just an afternoon of food in a supermarket. Uh, and and yet again, I go back to my question then. If you're, if you're trying to maximize your output and – you're trying to come up with the perfect model of self-sustaining farming. Why Central Texas? Well, that, that's because that's where we've had the real estate business, and we had okay. we were in, based in Austin, and we, you know, it, it it took a couple of years to build the business, and it took a couple of years to, to dismantle it, and so that's that's why we chose that location. That's a pretty, as you even point out on your welcome page, that's kind of a challenging place to do that. When there have been easier places around the country to to create that kind of farming environment? It is easier in other places. Central Texas has its challenge. It's at the intersection of five different bioregions, and you can get all the different weather patterns from all of those which are conflicting. And it, it, it is a very difficult place to grow. And, and since then, I've become almost a, a, quite a bit of a relocation expert as I've been traveling around the country looking for another place to move to. Right. Uh, yeah, and almost everywhere else is is easier, although anywhere you go, everywhere, everyone's facing, um, you know, let's call it climate change, but, but, you know, weather patterns are not what they have historically been. Um, you know, soil, good soil is not easy to come by anywhere. So a lot of the challenges that we face there are, are going to be faced by everybody everywhere. Um, although in some places, yeah, it's definitely going to be a little bit easier. They get well, I think... Way. Yeah. Isn't that step one, then, if you're thinking about becoming a self-sustaining farmer, is find the easiest place to start doing that? Would be And where would, that, where would you recommend? I mean, not I'm sure Central Texas is lovely and has some advantages, but if you were, right now, if you're going to pick from scratch and you're going to tell somebody, here's what you're going to do, if you, you, know, you cash out, you sell your house, and here's where you're going to go, where would X mark the spot for the perfect self-sustaining farm? Well, you know, that's unbelievably complex decision. It seems like it should be very simple, but you get into, you know, what are you going to do for money? Do you need to be near a, a metropolitan area for a job or employment? What about if you got kids? Uh, you know, we're talking about school and social life. Um, you know, if it's me as an individual just jumping off and going somewhere, well, you know, uh, and, and then you have other concerns. Are you concerned about the collapse of society as we know it, in which case being near large population centers is a huge detriment. Right. Uh, so there's there's a, there's a lot of factors that go into it. Uh, um, a couple of areas that come to mind. We we currently are looking at the Ozarks. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in the Southern Rockies, and then of course there's also your temperature right. uh, ranges that you can handle. The Pacific Northwest has a tremendous amount going on. For for our family, we've realized that we can't deal with you know four to six months of overcast, no sunlight for long periods of time. So, but if you can handle that, those areas have a tremendous amount going on. And then also the New England states have a lot. There's already a lot of local food growing there. Um, but, you know, cold winters, I'm originally a native Floridian. So you know, I the thought of moving to Maine is a, is a, is a fundamental body shock, you know? Right. Um, well, there's and, no shortage of fresh water up here in Minnesota, though. So keep that in mind. That, uh and, 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 you know, Jim Rawls, who is a survival blog and, and kind of the, you know, the, the voice of, of dealing with the end of the world as we know it, is up in northern Idaho. And, uh, you know, there, there again, you've got a, a severe uh, a northern climate. Yeah. The, the, the key thing, if you're going to look for, for moving somewhere, and it, and it is a very complex decision, the key thing is water. And, and then the next important thing is soil. And, and then I would say after that, because to be totally self-sufficient is 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 very difficult the next thing you want to look at is community 
because having other families around that are doing this that you can rely on for support, you can trade seeds or, or, or share breeding stock or all the different things that get into it when you start going, having other people around you that, that have skills and, and are doing it is, is a crucial factor. It increases yeah, when, your, yeah. And when you say breeding stock, you don't mean children. You don't mean like... <laughs> Intermingling with them and becoming related to them. You don't mean that. Well, you know, I don't mean that. But, you know, I guess ultimately <laughs> that does happen. I was thinking more of, you know, you've got rabbits and, you know, having yeah. somebody else with a buck, you change them out or roosters or cattle or, you know, whatever it is that you're growing. Right. Well, royalty have been doing that for, you know, centuries. So that's how I, that's how I, that's how I always look at, look at it. Uh, but you're, but I think you're, the point about community is really important because we've talked about this a lot on Coast to Coast. And I think there are some people – that imagine a dystopian future uh, and in one which they are completely self-reliant. And I think that is um, I, I, I think that's unrealistic to think that you could get by. You'd have enough ammo, enough seeds, enough of everything to be able to make it completely on one's own. And I don't even know why one would want to spend eternity by oneself fighting off other people or even just fighting with them, just not being in community with other people when you need it the most. That's right. And I, I agree with that. There's the community thing is a real, it's a real knife edge kind of balancing thing because you want to be involved with other people. And then at the other hand, uh, you know, having people involved and, and if they're not equal partners or stepping up or, or preparing or, or living the lifestyle, then, then, then they can also become a huge detriment. So it's a it's a real challenge. Right. Yeah. Uh, so we're, again, we're talking here with uh, Marjorie Wildcraft. It's uh, Ian and Marjorie on Coast to Coast AM, and the this case, this DVD tutorial uh, that uh, you can pick up by going to coast to coast AM dot com. You can link up to Marjorie's website there, uh, and you can find out more about how your grocery bill will double this year. Now. You've got to explain that because you you speak of that with a kind of certainty, and I'm I'm not saying you're wrong, but how can we know our grocery bill will double this year unless we know we're having you know twice as many kids or something? Well, let me say this: I hope it only doubles. You know, I think the things that are going on in in Egypt and Libya that we're the United States is only a couple of years behind that. There are four factors that are involved with with the increased price. And the first is the weather. And for the last decade, regardless of whether you, you know what you believe in climate change or whether it's human or not, or whether the harp and it's we're dealing with weather manipulation or weather warfare, regardless of what 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 you believe about what might be causing it, the fact is, as we've been having worldwide severe droughts and we've been having severe flooding, uh, we've there's been large large losses in crops. And, and our yields are not uh, what they used to be. I think out of the last 10 years in the last decade, we've only had one year where we actually produced more than we ate as a species. And we're now down to the – this is it. There's no – very, very the, – the reserves are razor thin. There's, there's almost no reserves. And we have to have perfect weather if we're going to make it through uh, – even the USDA just was talking about this a few days ago, that we have to have perfect weather and perfect crops in order to – be able to get by, uh, and that's not really going to be building our reserves. Some classic examples, Russia last year, uh, they, they had some severe droughts, and they went from being you know, one of the largest wheat exporters in the world to now they're out on the open market buying grains to feed their family and, and to feed their livestock. China is also starting to, to change from being a major exporter to being an importer. Part of that is they have a burgeoning middle class that's now wanting to eat meat, and they're buying grains for animals. Uh, but the fact is, is they're still going out. They're out looking to, to buy food. Um, and Australia has been having flooding. There's been there's been crop problems everywhere. So one of the first things is weather. So we're having a hard time with weather. And I hear some music, so I think we'll have to get back to the other three factors after the break. All right. Well, I'll hang on to that then. Uh, the other three factors that are involved in this, and yes, uh, we will also get to the question of do you need a gun to garden? Uh, Marjorie Wildcraft, you can find out more at backyardfoodproduction.com or link up to her through our webpage. It, I I have think I think about this all the time, and I think about it in terms of when the kids are off at college, 
and my wife and I are moving on into that next phase, then what would that phase look like and where would we be doing it? And maybe you are, too. We'll get to your questions for Marjorie coming up later on in the night. Keep on listening on Coast to Coast. This is Ian Punnett. And and that dirt, those dark and sticky places inside of us where a lot of people just rather not go. The places where things don't grow well, right? Uh, I think I think those two subjects actually tie together really well. The psychology of being independent, of being on one's own, and digging in the dirt to grow one's food. We'll explore that, too. We've got a couple more things on Marjorie Wildcraft's list, though, to get to first. And then we'll also get into some of the nuts and bolts of self-sustaining farming and how you, too, might someday be totally off the grid for your food production on the way next on Coast to Coast. This is Ian Ponnett. All right. And uh, Marjorie Wildcraft on Coast to Coast was just talking about uh, well, give me, what's the headline for the list again? How did you describe it? Uh, your grocery bill will double. Yeah, no. Or, but you said of the things that were on the list, you described it as the the oh, fact, the five factors or the we, just, we, got the. we got the four factors. And the first one we went through is weather. And okay. the weather, weather is, is definitely impacting crop production worldwide. And and the thing about the weather is is I know and we'll get to the government and how the government affects it, but you can't print food. No. Yeah. It's so, not the somebody, Jetsons. Somebody's got to grow it and it's and you, you need new rainfall and you need reasonable temperatures or you need less rainfall depending on where you are. You need the right the right conditions in order to grow food. You know, and people we have these huge winter storms and most of us are modern people are thinking, oh, those poor people in the airport, you know, they're stuck there. Right. We're not thinking, oh, my God, you know, there's cattle out in the Midwest that they're trying to get into windbreaks and that they're trying to get them water because it's all frozen. Or we're not thinking about, you know, the Montana wheat. All the snow cover has been blow off of it, so those plants are now exposed and they're going to likely die and we're not going to have the wheat production. Or, you know, South Texas, where the valley is, or, um, you know, Mexico, which this time of year, Mexico provides a huge amount of, uh, you know, the beans and, and squash mm-hmm. and tomatoes and that kind of stuff. In fact, Cisco Foods recently released, I think it was on, on Wednesday, they said um, every one of their growers has invoked the Act of God clause on their contracts. And Cisco Foods, and they're huge, they're saying um, expect limited availability volatile pricing, and mediocre quality at best. Basically, they're saying they don't have any food supplies, and their growers are all, you know, they had that huge uh, 50-year freeze in in Mexico that destroyed everything. Now, a lot of those crops that they're growing, the tomatoes and beans and peppers, are stuff they're going to replant, and hopefully we'll be getting more production again in three months. But, again, there's that. We're in that situation where there's no reserves. Uh, so again, so we're the 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 list is would just just so for people who are just catching on then. So the four factors that are going to go into the doubling of the food prices for this year, and weather being number one on the list. What's uh, let's talk about the other ones. The second one is the price of oil. Every aspect of food production, uh, other than very small sustainable farms, involves oil. So, you know, the huge combines where we're planting, uh, where we're, we're weeding or where we're tending, uh, even the uh, chemicals that we use to fertilize or the pesticides are made out of either natural gas or oil or some type of fossil fuel. And, of course, the harvesting and processing and transportation and a lot of the packaging is all based on fossil fuels and oil products. And the fi- price of food and the price of oil are directly correlated. You can look at the graphs. It's pretty simple. So as the price of oil goes up, the price of food goes up. If you remember in 2008 when oil was reaching 140 a barrel, there were the food riots breaking out around the world. And that's why the U.N. this year, earlier in December, when their food price index got so high above the 2008 levels, they were predicting before everything happened in January that there would be food riots breaking out around the world. And that is only going to intensify. I mean, we've already we've seen from the instability in the Middle East, we've seen the price of oil shooting over $100 a barrel. We had uh, the, the CEO of Gulf Oil saying, you know, expect $150 barrel oil this summer. 
that that's a, a very good likelihood of that. I mean, when you have CEOs of oil companies telling you that, <laughs> you know, you should probably pay attention. Um, well, yeah, and I at the same time, I I don't I, they're a little oily for me. So I mean, I. I <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't, I, you say we should pay attention. That's great. But I also think they'll find any excuse to jack up the price on a barrel of oil. And well, I think we exactly. see, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I just, the fact that they're saying it, I think a lot of that, that's kind of their, that's their wishful thinking all the time is that they're going to get the price of the oil way up without it costing them that it'll cost us that. And that's different. So I think that, again, we're looking at, you know, potential while crying poverty or saying with, you know, simply a matter of supply and demand. I think we're probably going to see huge again, huge windfall profits for these oil companies at the end of the year who look up and go, oh, how about that? Look how much more money we made. Oh, well, didn't see that coming. And and so, I, I mean, I'm 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 suspicious of them anyway. So, yes, I'm, I'm with you, but they would not be the yardstick by which I would measure whether or not that prediction is going to come true. Well, I agree that there there's probably going to be a lot of profit taking in that. Yeah. But at the end of the day, if you're paying five dollars a gallon for gas, you're paying five dollars a gallon of gas. Exactly. You know I mean? No, I know. Yeah. But it it all depends on who I get to be mad at. So that's just <laughs> yeah, that's true. That, that changes. But, but the correlation between the fossil fuels and the price of food. Food we basically have learned as a species how to turn oil into food. And, right. And, and that's there's a the drink direct link there. So well, the, the good point, news is too we turned how, we learned how to turn uh, foil, oil, you know, food into fuel too. So we can go both ways. <laughs> right? Well, we you can know, Yeah, but that's a huge and that's another issue. I mean, uh, about 25% of the corn that we grow here in the US is right. turned into ethanol, but that's a net I mean, that's the most stupidest policy we've ever gotten into. Oh, I'm not to be you know. not debating that. In fact, I think that that would be one way that one market force that might end the whole ethanol by law program. Hopefully, and hopefully there's a little bit of margin in the whole system because we've been wasting it on fuel that that, that actually could be used for few, for food as uh, if you want to consider GMO corn food. Now, that's a whole other question, too. I mean, I really don't consider that food that's fit for humans or livestock, but that's a, that's another conversation. Sure. No, I totally yeah. get that. All right. Well, let's, then, let's get to number three, then, on the list of the factors that will double grocery costs by the end of this year. And this is going to be government interference. So uh, we have governments looking at implementing price controls, tariffs. There's lots of governments who are already saying, hey, uh, we're not going to export anymore because we've got to feed our own population. Uh, and other government inter- interventions. I know even here in the, in the 70s, we, we had price controls or they tried to for a while there. But you can expect to see more of that. And while that doesn't necessarily affect the supply and demand type thing, it totally messes with those dynamics and totally interferes with food pricing. And anytime you get the, the government involved in anything, you're just going to create more inefficiencies and create more expense. Um, that you know, so the government getting various world governments getting involved in the crisis as it begins to to continue to heat up. Uh, that's going to be a factor that'll cost us money ultimately and cause the price of food to go up. Uh, uh, and, and then the fourth factor is going to be the traders, because you know there's always this profit motive. We lived in we live in a, you know let's make money world, and these guys are going to see you know they see the price of corn you know going up what eighty five percent in a year. And the USDA has just announced that, you know, even with all the big plantings we're going to have, we're probably just barely going to make and grow enough. And they're thinking, wow, anytime we have any bad weather, they're going to really exacerbate the pricing and, and, and cause, uh, you know, cause problems with the costs of things. And that's going to be a, another phenomenon, which m- may have been a whole the whole reason of what happened in uh, 2008 with, with oil going up to 140 a barrel was may have right. been totally due to the traders. But again, regardless of, of you know, what their motives are, and, and you, we're going to have price problems and fluctuations. The, the two key ones is going to be the price of oil and the, and the weather, but the governmental and the traders are going to cause all these exacerbations to the price due to their manipulations and intents and try to take profits or try to control it in one way or another. We're but talking with – go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> the price of your, – your groceries are going to – they've already gone up if you've been paying any attention. They've been messing with the packaging, sizing, and getting creative. Uh, but they're, they're, the underlying commodities are, are, have moved up very, very strongly, the corn, the wheat, and the soy. And, and now that we're having these problems with the weather, with the tomatoes and, and everything else – 
it's 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 going to be hitting a lot harder. It'll be much more noticeable in the next few weeks and months going forward. And as I said, I hope it only doubles. Yeah, I, I, I'm not. I, I I'll be very interested to to follow that prediction throughout the year. Uh, and you're certainly right about um, the size of packaging and, you know, what was – I just noticed this the other day when I was picking out something on the shelf and the price for the item was based on 16, the original 16-ounce size. But when I looked at the package, it was 12.5 ounces and they had – they didn't change the price. Obviously, they just dropped the amount that was in the package. And that's that's going on left and right everywhere. And, and it's, it's one way of trying to hold the line a little bit on – prices it's just you give up size and quantity so you look at that and and you forget to do the math to show that that means that grocery per ounce just went up significantly and probably still will but but at the same time a lot of americans i think um you know they waste a lot of food and i think that 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 in a way it's kind of an interesting market force if food gets more expensive people will eat less or perhaps they'll just waste less that's true. We do have a lot of margin in because we do waste a lot of food. There's there's yeah. a lot of margin in there. Also, Americans, we spend only, I don't know, what, 9.5 or 10 percent of our income on average on food. So and and in most in historically, that number should be around 20 or 30 percent. Uh, you know, so we we do have some ways to go, although. Of course, the people at the lower end of the economic spectrum are going to be hit the hardest and sure. hit first. And that's what we're seeing globally. You know, we're seeing the poorer right. countries with the food riots breaking out. So there, well, you know, we definitely have some, some room and some margin in there, but there's there's going to be a lot of a lot of complaining. <laughs> I, was th- I was thinking about that last, uh, last night. I'm actually coming to you tonight from Chicago where I'm at uh, the, the Clear Channel headquarters here. And thank you, Bob Fakuda, for getting us set up. And... And always the hospitality of Clear Channel Chicago, and it's very nice. And and I was eating at a restaurant. My uh, son goes to college here, and and uh, so I was visiting him and his girlfriend, and we were out to dinner. And, and uh, terrific restaurant. I'll even plug it. It was called Volari. W- wonderful, well known local Italian place. Totally packed. Right. So we're standing in line for our reservation. We've been there for they're twenty minutes past when they were supposed to seat us, but we're standing there. And it's such a small, compact place that you couldn't help but stand there where in the same lane where the waiters come and or the busboys come and they clear off the the plates of food that people haven't finished. So we're starving in the, you know, with the lower case S while we're waiting in line. And the plates of food that are coming past us that are not just half eaten, maybe a quarter, a third eaten. The Porsche, it's like somebody just, it was like, it was like being in, in Rome or something or being in some palace where there was just be, bring a big plate of food and I'll have a fork full and then throw out the rest. It just seems so ridiculous the amount of, and maybe it's because we were just so hungry, delicious looking food that was going to go tr- straight into some plastic bag somewhere in the kitchen. And you think about, about the starving people or you think about the amount of food that's getting wasted, the amount of money that's being spent. And it does, it makes me long for a paradigm shift on something like that for the future so that we would be making the most of the food production that we have. I, I agree. I totally agree. It's, I've often felt a lot of angst at just how, the unbelievable waste of our culture, not only in food but in everything else, in, in how we do things. So it, it'll, overall it'll be a good thing. And I actually, through this crisis, I feel very optimistic. And I think people going back to growing their own food, which, is, which, which ultimately is the solution, is, is also a good thing. The nutrition that's in the food that you're buying at grocery stores or in restaurants is, is paltry compared to what you can do growing in your own backyard. And if for nothing else, even if the end of the world as we know it weren't coming, I mm-hmm. think growing, growing your own food just for the nutrition and for the taste. I have people say, oh, but I, I don't want to grow vegetables. I hate vegetables. I say, you've probably never eaten vegetables. Right. You've never had a carrot yet. You've just had an orange stick. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, that's, that's, you know yeah. Right. So, so how many acres? Let, let, I mean, I know we could do these computations in innumerable ways, but let's just say I'll use it in the model that my my wife and I keep talking about. Where would we retire someday? Where might we go? And what 
might that retirement look like in light of, you know, maybe changes that are coming to Social Security uh, where we can't even expect to get back that which we put in, you know, that that's entirely possible that they're going to institute some means test that we won't be able to pass and that will be a drag. And, and so what would, you know, where, how, how much land do we need? And, and is there an easy formula for amount of land per person? Well, if you're going to be if you're going to be moving and you're looking at buying a little bit of land, a, a real quick answer to that is two acres will completely wear you out, and uh, you know provide you an abundance of food. It, it's, two acres is actually an incredible amount of land. Um, it, it really is a lot. Uh, John Jevons, who is the the um, developer of the biointensive gardening method, has actually and he's written a book called. Uh, how to grow more vegetables than you ever thought possible in less space than you imagined. <laughs> kind of a lengthy title, sort of no, like... No, it's perfect. Yeah, but it's perfect. And he has been the master of figuring out the minimal amount of land you need. And in Southern California, where he's developed this, he's come up with 4,000 square feet of bed space. So you're going to need more room, probably double or triple that, because you have to have paths and that sort of stuff in between it. And, of course, he's got four growing seasons there. That's the minimal amount of land if you wanted to grow, you know, like a 99% self-reliant, self-sustaining food system. And I would say that that diet that you can grow with that is very Spartan, and it's also very low fat. You'd want to have more room in that. Um, And so what's an acre, 40-something thousand uh, square feet, 46,000 square feet. So, you know, theoretically you could get, you know, four or five people on an acre if you were biointensive uh, farming it. Um, but realistically, you're not going to have those, in, you know, your, your yields are going to fluctuate from time to time. And and I would say, you know, two two people an acre would really be pushing it. You would, you would want, you know, uh, more than that. But two acres really is a lot of land. And when you get physically out walking around every day and working on two acres, that is really a lot of land. I'd also suggest, you know, even, you know, the, the yeah, I'm going to buy some land in a couple of years and move out kind of thing. I would suggest, even if you're living in an apartment, get started right now with something, anything. And it's really best to start small. One of the downfalls we had was we had a lot of land and we were scared and we wanted a huge amount of production going right away. And we planted way too much and we couldn't keep track of it. We didn't know how to care for it. So my my number one recommendation to people is to start small. Mm. Um, And and if you're in an apartment, that may just mean a couple of verbs in the windowsill. Sure. Yeah. But you're starting to get that habit of having to take care of plants and think about it. Kind of a survivalist chia pet. <laughs> there you go. You right. know, actually, there's an incredible value to it. Um, if you're if you're in the end of the world and you're just eating your beans and rice all the time, uh, you know, being able to jazz that up with a little basil or a little rosemary, sure. or, you know, that that can make a huge difference. No, I agree, and and or to be part of a Tabasco co-op, so where yeah, you can. There you go. <laughs> That's what I want. <laughs> Keep your basil. <laughs> Give me the hard stuff. Uh, so, uh, so very interesting. Again, we're talking about self-sustaining farming, and two two acres would be uh, would be plenty. But then you got to get into the question of water, and then also then about livestock. Let's say we don't just want veggies. Let's say we want the occasional egg. Uh, or that we're going to grow something that uh, that we would be willing to then, you know, m- maybe for a Sunday dinner or for special occasions or maybe even every day if we were interested in meat production, what would we have to do to meet that production coming up? We'll talk about that with Marjorie Wildcraft. And then the question is hanging out there on do you need a gun to garden? That'll bring me back to a conversation that I had on the show a couple of years ago with a guest uh, who made a prediction that all the things that Marjorie said could be happening this year or the years to come were already supposed to have happened, and that uh, that there people could grow all the food they needed just in their front yard, and there never was a worry at all about anybody coming by and taking it. The thought was just, well, why would they take it? They would just be growing their own. Not so fast, says Marjorie Wildcraft. We'll get back to that coming up next on Coast to Coast. This is Ian Punnett. Marjorie Wildcraft is teaching us all how we might be able to sustain ourselves, whether that's in a utopian or a dystopian future, it doesn't really matter. We Same principles are involved, whether you're 
farming in central Texas or in the Ozarks or out in the great Northwest. Doesn't matter. The, the same ideas apply. And she's done a lot of the trial and error work for us all. You can link up to her through coast to dot com. And, and she was going through the list, the four different factors that apply to why she thinks the price of uh, groceries are going to double this year. And we're that kind of gets sort of in a general conversation about what the factors are that will lead us to have a successful life in, in the world of self-sustenance. Um, Except I think she was also leaving something off, and we'll get to that coming up, along with the, the answer to the question, finally, do you need a gun to garden in the future? Next on Coast to Coast, this is Ian Ponnett. So Marjorie Wildcraft, I'll tell you about two years ago, I was having a similar conversation. I say similar, not exactly, but I was having a conversation with a a guest on Coast to Coast that was spoken in a certainty uh, that with which I I cannot um, go along that he said, you know, that by the end of this year of that year was 2008 or 2009. I can't remember exactly, but. Um, that the entire U.S. economy would break down, their, our currency would be worthless, um, and that uh, we would all be having – we would all basically be in a, a survivalist mode by the end of that year, right around you know like six or seven months after the conversation. Now, I, I just happen I, – I believe that there are all sorts of factors – Many of which you spoke of last hour, which I think are very importantly important and prescient, and I, I think you're you're a prophetic voice. But I also don't know that any of us can know for absolute certain when any of these things are going to happen. And the more we talk about the certainties, very likely the the most the more likely we are to be hoisted on our own petard on that. But in his case, in that conversation with him, I uh, I brought up the guns, and I said to him, I said, okay, well then, if you're right then shouldn't we all be arming ourselves right now that if we're going to start growing, say, just food in our backyards or food in our front yard and we have to start preparing for this as a future, um, you know, what kind of caliber should we have? What kind of weapon should we have? Because I can't believe that in a world of of haves and have nots, um, that the have nots are just going to sit by quietly and die. Um, and he kind of shined it off and, and we, you know, the, the conversation wasn't very fruitful, I didn't think. But I, that's why I was particularly attracted to your position on this, which I think is much more realistic about what might be happening. And I enjoyed your column about uh, do you need a gun to garden? And and was it at a was it like a general store or a hardware store? Where did you have that conversation with a guy who said he wasn't really planning for his farming future? a local store um, in, in, in Bastrop County. He was a local merchant, um, and I, I was shocked. I, I was shocked, really, quite frankly. I went up, and I was saying, here, you know, I make this DVD. It was right when, in the early days when we were first starting to market the DVD, and, you know, you start in your neighborhood. And uh, showing him the DVD and saying, it's right here, it's in Bastrop County, and, you know, you may need to grow food sometime. And he, he told me, quite frankly, I, I'm never going to need to grow food. And I said, well, what do you mean? Have you got that much stored up? You know, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, where do you live? You know? Right, exactly. <laughs> and he's, um, he's like, no. He pulls out a big semi-automatic, I don't know what, you know, uh, uh, from under the counter. He says, with this, I'm going to be able to get everything I need from people like you. And I was so shocked. I mean, because I really am not a gun person or I've become one, but I wasn't at that time. I, I just, I really, I, I couldn't even, I really couldn't even have a comeback because I was so shocked at that. And what has, and now Texas is definitely a gun toting, very proud about it state. Sure. Exactly. Uh, right. But but those kind of people are everywhere, so it's not like you can't say, well, that's just Texas. No, it's no, no. Just, and, and there's a difference between gun toting and threatening to rob you, basically. That if you've got the food, he's going to come and take it from you unless you stop him. I, that is shocking. But I've had that comment numerous times. In fact, I was on the on the air recently, uh, Ocean City, Virginia, and the host, quite frankly, said, well, that's my plan. You know, I'm going to come rob from people like you. Thank you for growing it. That was his right. exact words. Yeah. That was it. Uh, and that's I, I, I mean, that's why I'm using Marjorie Wildcraft, because with my my family last name and two minutes on the Internet, you know where my farm is. Huge right. security risk, you know? Right. Well, I think that's a, f- a really fair question. And, and we're, you know, I mean, you, you mentioned before, I mean, just 
to speak up for, you know, our, our listeners in the cities, you mentioned about having a farm and have it be near cities and what that might be like in the case of a food emergency. You don't have to you don't have to live near a city to have your food supply threatened. Obviously, in a rural area, there's plenty of people who their first thought would be, well, I'm, I'm going to go appropriate myself some farm." Right now, I'm going to use the and and so you you went out of your way to to start looking at weapons and to start planning on what that would be like for you to farm and then to also protect what you're growing and raising. Very much so. Yeah, and actually, I found it's kind of fun since then. I've gotten into target shooting and getting more accurate, and it's you know, and and we we've, we've taught the kids basic. You know, of course, you want to teach them basic safety. You know that kind of right. thing. So sure. we've we've begun to incorporate it, and it and actually, you know, when the Roman Empire fell, for centuries afterwards, they talked about the Pax Romana, the peace of the Roman Empire, and we live in an unbelievably peaceful time because of the strength of our our government. But as that collapses and erodes, and uh, I mean, we've already got cities now where they're saying, "Look, don't call nine one one. We're not coming." Uh, you know, as 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 uh, police budgets get cut and 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 things start to happen. Uh, there's talk now of, of predatory, uh, you know, uh, criminals out there that know that, that, that security is not what it used to be. Being responsible for our own security is, is an issue, um, you know, we're, we're going to need to address more and more. Quite frankly, it's not something I'm, I'm an expert in, but I'm learning. I feel that that's an important – you have to address that. I think that that's a reality that you need to look at. No, I think that's totally fair. And I I think that then the, the question is, too, is how when one is thinking of of securing this uh, this farm or ranch to raise food to, um, you know, to whether it's livestock or chickens and, and vegetables and fruit, then you also have to think in terms of protecting it. Because if you really do believe it, I mean, that's the the next natural step. If you really think that this government is going to decay and and we're going to be and I'm I'm not being colorful when I say you know if it's all going to turn into mad max well then your first step is maybe your most you know fatal one if you pick some place that will make you most susceptible to somebody coming in and you know stealing your stuff if if there's one of you or three kids and a you know a, a two maybe two spouses and whatever and there's nine people showing up in trucks you lose I mean, there just is. There's no. There's no way around that. that. That's true, you know, and that's one of the reasons to to maybe move out to a less, a more lightly populated area, to move out to an area or find an area where there are other people that are growing food. That you have community. Community is essential. Community is vital. You know, having your family on board, uh, so that way it's not just two 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 adults and, and and four children or whatever it is that you've got. You know, six or eight adults. And, 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 you know, you've got a group, and I, I think um, more and more we'll start to see that happen. We, we have nowhere near the conditions under which that's going to happen right now. Because things are still, like you're saying, there's still lots of leftovers on the plate. Right. That start to tighten up. If you want to go back to meat also, I would love to touch on that, because a lot of people are like, oh, I'm just going to raise it. You know, there's a lot of vegetarians out there. Meat is such a critical, and having livestock is such a critical component to having a full and complete system. The animals, uh, you, use their, you use their feces as a part of fertility. In fact, you know, some of the, the rabbits and the geese and the chickens we have, of course we're getting meat and we're getting eggs and feathers and that kind of things. But more importantly... It's their their uh, excrement, their their fertility. Uh, fertility is one of the biggest keys to success in growing food, uh, and having livestock and being in, involved in that whole circle is uh, is very important. I just wanted to get that one. No, no, and I and actually I'll explore that. So, how many? If we talked about uh, the amount of acreage for uh, for people to be able to manage and then also be able to take advantage of what kind of livestock do you think would be is there a way of doing the math on that so that we could get a better idea of how much acreage you would need for livestock and or how many individual you know animals would one need in order to sustain a group of two or four or six well sure let me give you a couple of specific examples now we i love rabbits Rabbits work really, really well in a lot of bioregions. If you're going somewhere where you have a very short growing season in the north, it's going to be a little bit harder. But, for example, in, throughout most of the, the southern parts of the United States and the more, more milder regions, rabbits are excellent. They're herbivores, 
So they're going to eat your grass clippings or your landscape trimmings. They're not going to be competing with you for food, basically. They'd love your carrots, but don't let them eat them. Uh, I, have a, I have an 8-cage rabbit hutch. It's 20 feet long by 2.5 feet wide. And out of that, we're getting about 80 to 90 rabbits a year. And I did the math on it recently. And for our family of four, two adults, two kids, that's about half of the protein requirements. Very small space. Uh, quiet animals. You're not going to, if you're in, if you're in an urban situation, you're not going to have city ordinances to worry about, because they're not going to know about it. Um, and and uh, the, the other great thing I like about them is you process them as needed, so you don't need to refrigerate. Uh, you know, we're always looking at systems of how do you do it without electricity or how do you do it without all the conveniences that we have now. So you know, having a cow is a wonderful thing, but you know, you butcher a cow, that's a huge amount of work, and then what do you do with all that meat? So having rabbits, you can get the equivalent amount of meat out of it in, in, in a year with the reproduction they have, and it comes in family-sized chunks. Um, right. Yeah, so we've also got it set up that the cage is above the ground and their pellets fall in a compost pile right underneath it, and that compost underneath is probably more important than the rabbits themselves because we're using that to nourish uh, the rest of the land. Uh, and rabbits, you know, besides being, as you said, sort of prepackaged for a family size, you know, as you're as you're saying, you and you you did mention the pelts too that you can use for that. We do, yeah. You know, in our in our DVD, we include a whole CD-ROM full of documents, and we have a whole thing on tanning there, uh, yeah. how to tan the pelts and use them with very very simple chemicals that you can get. Um, I'm looking for a system, maybe using the brains where you can do it completely on farm with or, or in your yard without buying anything. And, and our whole systems are all geared toward that. Because if you're having to go buy seed or go buy something from the store, that's, you know, that kind of negates the whole process. So we're always looking at how do you do this completely with nothing? You know, how do you do it completely on, how do you generate all the fertility right there in your yard? Or, you know, how, how can you do all these processes without, you know, having to go out and buy something every week at the seed store? Sure. Uh, but I would I think there are many people that I know in Minnesota that maintain um, year round rabbit hutches, even with the cold weather, even such as it is. And I can think of at least two uh, two people that do that um, as a as a hobby and they raise rabbits, not as companion rabbits, but um, to be, you know, to be commercially sold and or, you know, shared. So we, I, we, we love it, and you know, and, and one of the other things we include in there is a whole section on on how to do butchering, and uh, we, we kind of debated on that for a while. But I felt it was so important. Uh, you know, the basic skills of how to butcher an animal is is such a crucial thing that that, that everybody really should know. Uh, and so we include it in there, and we we do it very very uh, very lovingly. And in fact, I've had quite a few vegetarians write me and say, "Well, they're not ready to do that yet, but they could. They feel that it was possible after watching it." So I thought mm. that was a tremendous uh, accolade. That seems impossible, to be totally honest. But uh, but I'm I'm willing to take your word for it until I I see the DVD. So the but to go back to then, so rabbits might provide enough, like about half of the meat protein that you might need. Uh, talk, let's talk about chickens. You know, chickens are are wonderful for egg production. A lot of people think, oh, I'm going to have a flock of chickens and I'm going to eat a chicken a week. And if you're going to eat a chicken a week, that means you're going to have to have a flock of about, you know, 60 chickens or so at least because, you know, it takes you know, time for them to raise them and, and reproduce. And if you're going to have that many chickens, you're going to be buying chicken feed. And, again, if you're buying chicken feed, that kind of defeats the whole purpose. So chickens for eggs, though, makes a whole lot of sense. If you even just have a small backyard, you can have two or three laying hens, and they can scrounge around and find bugs or maybe eat, you know, your scraps or and, and really require almost no input at all and yet produce, you know, uh, you know, at least a couple of eggs for you a day. So they aren't they aren't going to lay year round. Some breeds are better than others, but you'll you'll mostly have the eggs that you need. And uh, uh, if you have a little more acreage, you know, if you're doing the two acre type thing, having a flock of about a dozen chickens, they can pretty much fend for themselves with very little um, uh, external input, and and produce you a, a fair amount of eggs. So and that's that's what I'm all about is how do you get food for for nothing? High quality protein, of course, obviously. Um, and uh, it, the chickens are fabulous, so I want to shift people's thinking from eating them necessarily, sure. really one every now and then, but really the egg production is the key there. 
Uh, well, and the um, just like you mentioned before about people who have never really tried eating vegetables that they've raised themselves and just how um, uh, splendid the flavor is, just how powerful the flavor can be of something that you may have been eating your whole life without realizing exactly how it was supposed to taste. The same thing's true with, with eggs, with organic eggs. I, I, was, uh, I made a, a bid at a church auction on somebody that was doing um, egg raising, you know, chicken laying eggs in the, in the city right here in, 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 in a metropolitan area. And I got, uh, I think I got a dozen eggs a week for 12 weeks as a result of my, my church bid. And I loved them. They were just, they were, they were, they did taste different. They were smaller, but I loved every bite a lot more than the larger, more flavorless eggs from the supermarket. There's another key point you're talking about, too, that is a general truth, and that is the higher the quality food, your body knows the nutrition, and it's satisfied by nutrition. You don't need to eat as much if you're eating highly dense, nutritionally dense food. And that even goes up to wild crafting, which is another thing that we talk about, is, you know, what the dandelions in your yard, you know, what are the oak tree in your yard that's tossing down those acorns? There may be food sources right there at your feet that you're thinking of as a nuisance. It's surprisingly, when you eat those foods, you know, we all think, oh, we're going to get a big salad bowl. But you really only need a small amount of that to really satiate you. So uh, it, it definitely is a different lifestyle. Um, and, and eating these higher quality foods, yeah, you know, there's definitely much more more flavor. I mean, uh, the chicken that you buy commercially is is a totally different thing from the chicken that you raise in your own backyard. It's a completely different thing. Yeah. Uh, we're, again, we're talking with Marjorie Wildcraft. You can link up to her through coasttocoastam.com. You can find out more about uh, getting into self-sustaining farming. Just the all of the things you would need to do, whether it's farming or whether you're going to be raising your own livestock, um, the the real sort of breakdown on how this would work and where you would have to be and what type of arrangements you'd have to make. And that brings me back then to a conversation about the city versus the suburbs versus the exurb uh, versus the rural area. Um, it, you know, somebody has a, a nice, um, they might have a, a nice big, Let's let's give them credit. Say there's an acre of land that they live on in a suburban area. Some plots are that large. Uh, how much food could they really be growing even there um, in in a suburban environment? How much closer could they get to a self sustaining model if they really put their mind to it? They could do a tremendous amount on an acre. In fact, they could become pretty close to self reliant on an acre if you know. Say that you've only got two or three people. The, the key thing that takes a lot of production room is the fertility. So, you know, you can have a, a great big garden, and if you're not continually replenishing that with, with organic matter and, and nutrients, then you'll deplete it pretty quickly. And, uh, it, you know, you, about two-thirds of your energy and of your growing and of your, your interest and resources needs to go into generating and regenerating the, the, the material you need to keep the fertility up. Um, you know, so there's a lot of people, there's a family in uh, Southern California that just, you know, really small backyard and they're producing just a ton of food. What they're doing is they're importing the fertility, though. If you have an acre, you can certainly create a, a tremendous amount of the fertility right there in your backyard. And I would encourage, even if you're living in an apartment, I really encourage everybody to get started with just anything even small because you never know where you're going to be in another year or two. And starting to develop these skills is very important. It takes a long time to learn. So starting right yeah. now, wherever you're at. Yeah. And, and to make make the psychological adjustment to that. So you start to feel like, hey, I can do this. And, yeah. uh, and, and, and exactly how you're going to get from point A to point B. Well, the DVD tutorial will help. You can find out more by linking up to Marjorie Wildcraft at our website. So I mentioned earlier in the hour, I thought there was something she was leaving off of um, the conversation about community. Um, about uh, self-defense, about um, being able to manage life in a time when there may not be the government systems, be they local or national, uh, to help provide structure to a future. And I'll give you one of the thought I think you need to throw into that coming up next on Coast to Coast. This is Ian Punnett.
looking at what we've got, and you don't know what you've got till it's gone, but it never hurts to be prepared for that next phase, which is what Marjorie Wildcraft is talking about. We'll continue this conversation before we get to your phone calls here coming up at the top of the hour. And uh, and there's more to be said about how these communities might look in the future. And, and I'll offer what I think of as being one thing that m- should be part of the conversation, which I haven't heard yet mentioned and I don't see often mentioned on any of the websites that I go to that talk about this kind of thing. Also, if you're going to websites tonight, go to coast to coast am.com. Uh, we put up a link to the conversation that we had, uh, the coast insider group. We get together all the time and have a sort of a private chat. Um, they're always fun and they were kind enough to put up an excerpt from the one we did last Wednesday. You might enjoy that. Go take a look online, coasttocoastam.com, and uh, and back with your future, perhaps. What you need to know to be ready, perhaps, next on Coast to Coast. This is Ian Punnett. Well, you know, a couple of things I wanted to mention, I've just sort of been making notes, not that you haven't thought all of this out already, Marjorie, but they haven't come up in conversation. So I just want to make sure I brought it up as long as we're talking about our safety and our security and our prolonged happiness in the future uh, and how much of that can be self-sustaining. One of those things is fish. We haven't talked about that. And uh, I know that if you're looking at doing a farm, say, in the great Northwest or something or areas, say, in the Ozarks, um, getting fish, um, uh, whether it's from stocked lakes or from rivers, um, that is also a great way of uh, of protein and and. How hard would it be to have, say, a stocked pond um, at your disposal? Oh, you know, that I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up. Yeah, I would have to say that the pond we have, where we stocked it with uh, catfish and perch, has been the easiest food source we have created. It, it really has been. And you just stocked them. We made sure there were enough minnows in there, left it alone, and came back and got, got some fish the next year and then years after. Uh, so aquaculture is, is absolutely, if, if you've got, you know, a pond uh, or room for that, that is absolutely the easiest way to go that, that we've experienced. Our little pond in Texas, we have such dramatic changes in weather and climate. Um, you know, it goes from being almost, you know, a large quarter of an acre down to almost a little puddle. We're really glad it never actually completely dried up. So it's not always as reliable as we'd like. If you're in a place where you've got some regular water that stays there, absolutely. And then even on the other range of it, um, we haven't done as much experimentation as I would like, but there's a whole system of barrel ponics or aquaponics where you and people do this in 55-gallon drums and they'll raise some fish in the drums. The fish excrement in the water is used to fertilize plants that are growing in other drums and the plants are used to clean the water and the water, the clean water is sent back to the fish. Uh, one of the reasons we haven't done a lot is it involves some pumps and it involves a little bit higher technology than I personally want to be involved with. I'm very interested in 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 things that don't require any electricity or or, or any moving parts at all. Uh, but the people that do barrel ponics uh, claim some very high yields, and I know I've been working with some military families that you know they're only in one place for two years and then they move there in another base and another base and they're wanting to get food systems up and going and they are very successfully using these barrel ponic systems because then they can just pack that up and move and they don't have to have earth and ground and yet they're still growing you know some of their own food supplies certainly gaining skills and gaining familiarity and and uh, it's a system that's working for them uh, fish absolutely there's a lot of places in the in where it's not going to be possible more of your arid southwest and and some of the more arid places, water is just at such a premium, you know, you're not going to be able to have a pond. But in the places where you can, absolutely, uh, aquaculture is is the easiest way to go by far. Uh, And uh, and I I hope there are DVDs out there or that uh, this is something that you address as well on how to stock it and what's overstocking and how to make sure that, you know, you don't, uh, that you, the fish you do have have enough of uh, the right, you know, temperatures and depths to be able to create more food for the future? Uh, absolutely. We have a whole 
document on that. And, and the vast majority of ponds are an acre or less in size. They're all small ponds. I think there's actually a million of them in Texas alone. Uh, and we do have documents to help you figure out what, what kind of fish you want to put in there and, and, and how to take care of that. Um, but yeah, aquaculture is uh, absolutely a big must, as well as we also have information on, on barrelponics and, and how to get started with that. Oh, I like that. But now the the one that, thing that I, I don't hear often mentioned, and I, I don't mean this as criticism, but I think it's so crucial. Um, and yet it's uh, it's spoken of almost like one isn't going to need it. And that is health care. And when we're looking at these self-sustaining communities in the future, uh, somehow, and I read a lot of this material, the idea of uh, health care is sort of limited to being able to make wood splints for broken legs and or, you know, uh, be able to provide uh, uh, aloe for wounds or something. And that there, I think we are as a species, we're much more complicated than that. And I was wondering whether the, those considerations about long term health care and whether or not you might have a doctor in a community or whether there would be ways to, for a community to get behind this this is uh, to sustaining a doctor if the doctor were willing to sustain them. Yeah, I, yeah very much. Medical is a big component. And, um, right, you know, personally in my life, one of the things I'm doing right now is switching to things that I can use. For example, uh, garlic. I just recently had some sinus trouble and found that eating a clove of garlic on a regular basis completely knocked out the sinus infection that I normally have with that. And I'm like, wow, what a powerful antibiotic. But, sure. you know, during, but during the Civil War... Uh, you know that was a standard issue to a soldier was a was a garlic and um, yarrow and the yarrow is for stopping blood and the and the garlic was for infection uh, and so learning to use those things we recently we we regularly sponsor workshops uh, with interesting uh, people that have skills that are very simple and we had uh, we had one gentleman bringing up alternatives to dentists now, how can you brush your teeth just using sticks how do you make your own little toothbrushes and how do you care for your teeth what kind of just natural herbal supplements can you use to help rebuild enamel? And another neat thing that we've been working with is how to treat infections without antibiotics. So poulticing, uh, you know, using the local plants in your area, whether that's plantain leaf to make a poultice or in the southwest it would be using prickly pear leaves. Absolutely. And, and the time to start that is right now, getting familiar with those treatments now and finding out how effective they are and under what situations they're effective, and, and, and transitioning your life into that right now rather than saying, oh, you know, I've got the book on it and I'll learn it you know, right. later, you know. Well, so. but, and I, and I, I, I still think that that, and I appreciate everything you said, but I, I know from, from, I think that there are other models that are out there that, are, that maybe even come from antiquity, and you want to go back to the Civil War, but I, I think there are plenty of, of models for when, uh, a, a co-op of farmers, of people, whether they contracted with a teacher, whether they contracted with a doctor, they made a they made a point to for them to all contribute to the welfare of somebody that was going to provide a service to their families or to you know a group of families um, in exchange for you know the things that that theoretically that doctor wouldn't have time to grow. On his or her own, and I'm I'm not necessarily talking about Dr. Quinn, medicine woman, but it's not a bad reference here. Um, and I, I think that there, I think that is something too that communities can be thinking of if they're if they're if they're planning on saying getting you know ten families together in the Ozarks. How might you be able to arrange to have a doctor's care um, available to you, and what you'd be willing to trade off as a community to get it? Yeah, very much so, and that's that's an excellent model. And it, not only the doctors, but the uh, the herbalist, who is the the person that knows the local plants. And uh, I, I foresee a mixture of all sorts of things. I mean, personally, we have a small stash of antibiotics that we keep on hand. I, I'm not a big fan of using them, but in an emergency, I I want to have that available. In addition to learning all the, you know, the herbal alternatives, and and so we'd have a combination of things. I was reading recently about the collapse of the Soviet Union, and one of the surprising things was doctors began to make house calls. <laughs> right after after that society started to you know uh, undergo the tra- changes they did because the medical systems which are hugely inefficient 
uh, and it makes a lot more sense to a doctor to come out to you. And, and yeah, you know, will will that doctor suddenly be very interested in getting a chicken from you in exchange for you, you know, treating uh, that broken leg or, or that injury with the, the chainsaw or, you know, the, the new activities you're going to be involved with are going to involve new injuries. Um, so absolutely. Well, yeah. yeah. I, just, I just think that's something worth, worth thinking about. I, I say that because we are looking at, at retirement models, just, you know, we're a long way off from that. But we were looking at some of the things that are making some parts of the country more desirable than others. And when, if you, we, you know, I think it's easy sometimes when we think about um, a self-sustaining farm, we work in the presumption that we'll always be 100 percent healthy um, or that by working on the farm, the farm itself will make us 100 percent healthy. And I'm not saying it won't improve our health, but things happen. And it's it's I think that, you know, some of those highly desirable retirement areas are the ones that have um, health care systems in place and plenty of doctors um, that are willing to work with people as they're aging as opposed to just, say, emergency care or something like that, where just for the active. Yeah. Um, I, so I, I just I, I offer that to you. Now, what about uh, uh, what about governing systems? Have you, Do you have a model where people, you know, anytime you're you're looking at, say, 10 families, 10 farms and you would have how would you begin to determine how things would be governed for a community that might be pooling some resources and expending those resource, resources as a community pool? You know, I think that's going to manifest differently in a lot of different regions. One thing I've been fascinated is for um, example, the, the, the I'm experiencing the, an audio drop again. Uh oh, have on a this end. Here. Yeah, have and I don't know why. Uh oh, and I'm sorry about this. This is the second time this has happened. Um, so, Marjorie, you may be talking to me right now, but I absolutely cannot hear it, and I don't know why. And there doesn't seemingly be anything I can do about it. I'm told that the last time that this happened, that everybody could hear me on the other end, uh, but uh, I was unable to to know when I was and wasn't being heard. So I'm just going to keep talking because I'm not. And, and I'll tell you what, I, I'll stop for a second. If you want to interject something there, Marjorie, hopefully one of the tech guys will jump in and solve this problem. Um, but I'm not even seeing anything showing up to me from your end, the audio from your end. Hello. Um, Hello. Can you hear me now? So I don't know quite what to do once Can more. Can you hear me now? Hello? Hello? Is, I'm going to um, check my... Uh, my text messages here. If uh, if you if Gina or Jesse, you want to quickly let me know what's happening, what you can hear and what you can't hear, because uh, I'm completely in the dark again. Okay. Well, I'm going to hang this up, Technic- and, and oh, uh, I'm going to hang this up. Thank and you. Let them- there, no, there, there you go. We're oh, we're back, back in. Okay. 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 Thank you. I don't know what happened. Um, this is the second time this has happened in in this show, and there's something that's automatically switching off the. The connection with L.A. and I don't know what it is, but it's uh, highly frustrating. And I can't even if I left the studio to go down the hallway to get the tech guy. I'd have, by the time I got back, the problem would be where it is. So thank you. And I don't know what happened or what you said, but I'm sure it was brilliant. <laughs> well, thank you for that confidence. <laughs> you know, as things unfold, I think regionally and and in different locations, they'll be different. And this is starting to get into speculation of how does it look like once our government has collapsed and how do people organize. And I, one thing I'm very fascinated by, I'm not a Mormon, but the Mormon Church is already superbly organized, uh, you know, with, with their people and how they contact each other and having backup food supplies and being prepared for emergencies. So it's very interesting in the, you know, in the West where, where the Mormon Church is strong. You know, undoubtedly that will be the new government that steps in. And I think in other areas where there, where there are religious bases, um, you know, in some areas it may be the military, uh, a military base with uh, strong leadership and, and commanders may end up becoming the, the central focus. Uh, you know, and this is pretty far down in terms of where we've already collapsed and, and uh, you know, our, the, we call it the FUSA, the former USA, uh, and it's pretty openly acknowledged that the United States has, has completely uh, dismantled. Um, you know, how long it'll take to get into that and how, what, you know, what sort of groups would we have areas where there are warlords, um, 
you know, or, uh, you know, superior force and strength, uh, managing large groups of slave labor to grow food. I, you know, will that sort of thing, I'm sure there'll be a diversity of different ways. Uh, humanity has been very creative in its history of organizing uh, labor and, and, um, and resources. And I imagine all those different varieties will, will surface in different forms. And again, you know, I can't, you know, that's a very speculative look at the, at the future, uh, in, in how that'll unfold. You know, I, I would tell you that I would, I think it's one thing when you have homogenous groups, um, like say if everybody were Mormon in an area, um, but p- the part of the American experiment, part of the American experience from the very beginning has been pluralism. And I, I think that we, I would hate to think that we would lose that. I would hate to think that we would only be able to survive by being with like people, um, because I think that misses kind of the point of what made us strong to begin with. Um, and I think that there I, – I hope that there would be systems other than religious systems that would kick in and take over an area or, for that matter, warlords that would, you know, survive on a, on a might equals right basis. I, I'd like to – and I don't, I don't know that I agree, by the way, the idea that we're – this is some foregone conclusion that we're going to break down this way. Um, but that's partly colored by the idea that I've been on a few programs with a few predictors and that have all – so far all been wrong. Um, and some of those predictions were supposed to have happened a long time ago. So, I mean, I, I think there's hope. I really do. And I think that – I'd like to think, though, that there might be other systems – that we could have in place where people that are not linked for anything other than just the need to get by and to get along would be able to implement a system that had nothing to do with um, power or, um, or you know, divine authority. Well, this is, this is certainly what I hope for. The most immediate thing that we're going to be, be concerned about is feeding ourselves. And, and the calorie will essentially be the new component of, of the new currency of, of what's important. And, and how things organize will organize around what is going to be the most efficient way to, to grow food and, and acquire uh, nutrition for, for the populace. And personally, I would love to see things become more village or tribal oriented with an egalitarian or natural leadership forming as it's, as it's needed. Uh, and you're right. These are these are scenarios for collapse that are pretty far, hopefully fairly far out there. Uh, we have a long ways to go, obviously, before such a scenario manifests. Um, but I, I feel food is going to be the big crisis of sure. 2011. You know, Americans have really never ever been hungry, and and there is no living memory of famine. You know, the, right. the Great Depression was the closest we came to it, and most of those people are are gone now. Uh, right. No, that's a really good point. How, how about this, though? Why not practice? If you're, say, going to be out in an area and you're thinking about doing this, even if it is not a matter of, you know, this year or next year or, you know, even five years from now, why not start practicing that form of government right now, working out with other neighbors and just having these, What you know, in high school would have been what? Uh, what do they call those junior governments or whatever? When they And it just... Practice that. Um, and so even if you're not actually making decisions yet, you're just getting together and having the conversations, having the models um, so that when something, God forbid, should happen, you're ready to kick that in. And it's not a matter of having to learn it at a time that's already stressful with a greater loss of food production and all of the other systems that would get disrupted as well. So are you thinking about your future? What would be the one question you'd like to have answered from Marjorie Wildcraft, you can link up to her by going to coasttocoastam.com and uh, and see the DVD. It's a tutorial on how to get a life on one's own started. Uh, I'm going to start down the hallway here and try to figure out why we keep getting this dropout on the air. And uh, and when I say dropout, by the way, I don't mean anybody. I'm not. I'm not pointing the finger at anybody that didn't finish their degree. I just mean the audio dropout. And then your questions coming up next on Coast to Coast. This is Ian Punnett. Well, I think we have one wild card line open for Marjorie Wildcraft. Or, or a wildcraft line, we could even call it too. 
Uh, grab one while you can. All the other lines are jammed. We'll try and get one open for you so you can get in on this conversation. What you need to know in order for you to eventually become a self-sustaining farmer. How do you see your future and what can she tell you to get from point A to point beyond next on Coast to Coast? This is Ian Ponnet. So uh, all I can say is we hope we've got all the technical problems worked out enough that we can go forward from here with uh, Marjorie Wildcraft, who is hanging on for Jonathan, west of the Rockies in New Mexico on Coast to Coast. Jonathan? Hey there, uh, Ian and uh, Marjorie. Um, quite a while ago, I'd say, um, probably 1999, I was in a bookstore and um, just happened across an aisle on a Native American um, culture, cultural books and you know, thumbing through some books, and you know, I found uh, that I was quite interested in uh, um, making your own uh, bows and arrows, and I actually haven't quite gotten fully into that yet. Um, and even after all this time, but you know, I for the longest time I was saying, "Oh, that'd be a good hobby," and then it kind of extended into thinking about you know primitive living. And I've come to the conclusion that uh, you know, a mix of both uh, farming, even just a small, like Marjorie was talking about, a small field. Um, mixed with some hunting and and gathering wild plants would probably be a good way to to live. Um, unfortunately, I've actually went back to school uh, for another degree um, in 2008. I'm getting close to finishing up, but uh, is it is it possible to really actually learn this stuff and and fit that in with a busy work and school schedule? Yeah, I would say it, yeah, I would say it is, and it, and it requires focus. You know, it's going to be sacrificing episodes of friends or whatever else it is that you're normally involved with, um, and and recognizing that this is your your new hobby. Um, but the primitive the primitive skills I find are unbelievably healing to, and I'll use the root chakra terminology. It's re- unbelievably healing to your sense of security. Uh, to be able to make a bow and arrow and, and to hunt that way, or to be able to make fire by friction just using sticks. My and and on the other hand, uh, being able to use firearms and hunt is going to get you up to speed and be able to get you meat a lot more quickly than right. than archery. Uh, you know, um, and I feel that we're so close to where we're we're having prob- we're, we're we're on the cusp of a huge food crisis. At this point in time, time is of the essence. Uh, yeah. so, you know, learning to grow food and, and learning to hunt as effectively as possible. And absolutely hunting, you know, for sure, and learning to wildcraft, learning your wild edible plants. As I've mentioned before, acorns or, uh, you know, there you are in New Mexico and you've got lots of, you know, the choya fruits and the and the prickly right. pear and mesquite beans and learning how to use those and, and learning how to cook them in a way that's palatable to you. You know, there's a big difference between what's edible and what's palatable. Right. Very good. Thank, thank you, Jonathan. We'll, we've sure. got a couple of the people who are going to be hanging on. Good luck with that. By the way, Marjorie, I think that was a valiant pop culture reference. But just you know, Friends went off the air in two thousand four. I'm just okay. telling you. I'm not much of a television watcher. Obviously, <laughs> I know. I, I thought I, I could tell you were really trying on that one. I was good, but uh, I, <laughs> first time caller line. Matt is in Maryland on coast to coast. Matt. Matt. He's gone. Robin in the Bay Area on a wild card line on coast to coast for Marjorie Wildcraft. Uh, well, there's a Charles in Berkeley. Let me try that. Yes. I'm What's here. that? Thank you so much. Oh, there you go. Marjorie, this is really wonderful. You're on the air. And thanks, Ian, for having this, this topic. Um, I've been working with a group of folks here in California for a number of years. We're kind of going in the other direction, but I wanted to see where this might intersect with your ideas. We've been working on probably one of the most high-tech hydroponic systems that's ever been developed, in my opinion. Our goal was to produce as much food as possible with as little surface area as possible with a fixed water supply. We actually have scientists from Israel, uh, former chemists from NASA. We have a whole group of folks from UC Davis and also a group from France, and they're all sort of combined their technical and scientific talents to come up with this sort of modular system. And these things have actually been used in various parts of the world, especially where environmental conditions are really challenging. So my, my thought would be, and by the way, I really like the idea that community is going to be the, the trick to this because 
our vision is groups of families or small uh, areas, you know, where you might have like a collection of towns that sort of share and exchange their food crops. And our, and our big test was to see if we could grow enough food on the roof uh, of an apartment building to not only feed everybody in the building, but actually have surplus that they could trade to other apartments. That was kind of one of our visions. So I was just kind of okay. wondering, are, are, do you see, the, is this something that you're interested in, or do you see this as part of a larger array of systems that you might incorporate into your vision about, you know, food being the commodity of the, of the future? Right. I think that that urban environment of taking these abandoned factories, you know, these uh, six or seven story high factory buildings and turning those into hydroponic farms, et cetera. What do you think of that, Marjorie? I I, I think that we should be focusing on any area we can where we're growing food. And like in Detroit, where they're talking about bulldozing those old neighborhoods that are all now foreclosed upon and turning those back into farmland or, or the aquaponics or hydroponics. One of my concerns with going into higher technology and one of the reasons I haven't personally pursued that a lot, is the potential for EMP, electromagnetic pulse, to, you know, destroy all the electronics on Earth, or, or, or a judicious use of a nuclear bomb to, 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 again, have a similar effect of wiping out all the technology. You know, you may not have that deep a concern about that dire of a consequence. I'm also, I, I also really like things that are simple and very primitive and something that anybody could do because it's, you know, stuff you can find on the ground or in your neighborhood. And I certainly applaud, you know, because there, there needs to be solutions for urban environments. Half of our population lives in urban environments, and we need to do something. Not everybody's going to be able to move out to the countryside, so we need to look at all the solutions we can. By the way, did you, were you able to produce enough food for everybody in the apartment complex. I'd be very surprised if you were. Those kind of yields are phenomenal. But what, have you done that? Oh, I'm afraid he's already gone. So, oh, okay. um, well, But I think that's an interesting question. And, and even as, as an experiment, to be able to be down that road, even if you can't get it for everybody all at once, you know, perfection, you know, uh, perfect is the enemy of the good in one sense. You just got to always keep moving the ball forward and, and see what you can learn, I think. Yeah, experimentation yeah. and learning. Let's go for it. Yeah. Uh, east of the Rockies, John is in Lamont, Pennsylvania, on coast to coast for uh, Marjorie Wildcraft. John? Good evening, Ian. Marjorie, hey, uh, I just wanted to bring something up. When you mentioned about corn uh, not being um, used for ethanol production, uh, it's too important for food uh, a little while ago. Um, I, there are a couple of things I wanted to mention along with that that uh, is kind of bothersome, hasn't seemed to take off for at least as far as somebody to study it far enough to either refute or support uh, the claim. So I'd like to mention uh, involving a couple of different guests uh, on Coast to Coast. First of all, Howard Bloom. Uh, a couple of years ago, George Norrie sort of commissioned him to look into uh, uh, what was happening with the uh, uh, corn prices at the time that were shooting sky high. And he found that, uh, and uh, uh, as I'm Looking at this here, it's uh, June 4th, 2008, that Howard Bloom was on in the third hour uh, talking about this. He found that uh, OPEC had bought up a huge share of uh, futures in corn on the, on the commodities market. And that they had, I mean, just a spectacular amount uh, that they had uh, purchased in order to drive the price up at that time to scare people out of using corn for ethanol. And apparently in a lot of areas that worked. Um, the other thing is, um, corn is not a very good, uh, feedstock for ethanol production to begin with. Uh, I know David Bloom, um, has uh, been a guest on here as well that, uh, talks about some, uh, some other crops that are much better suited to producing alcohol, alcohol, ethanol that, uh, can produce, uh, larger, uh, capacity, you know, many, many times more gallons per acre than corn ever could. Uh, but if you're going to use corn, um, there is also, I've seen some um, research apparently that if you make the ethanol with the corn first, uh, the mash that is left over is still good feed for cattle, uh, for livestock. And that uh, if you make sure that you... <laughs> you know, take the starch out of it and use it for ethanol production first, um, you're left with a higher protein okay. feed and that uh, it can actually make it better, make it more beneficial for cattle. Okay. 
Well, let's get a question or something in here for Marjorie. Don't, well, uh, so was there something in particular you wanted to ask about that? I guess not. That I just make her aware of it, see if she's known anything about it, and I'd really like it if she or someone else could, you know, look into this further. I mean, I know that's not something you're going to do tonight, but uh, to either confirm or deny the what okay. Howard Bloom found out about that. Thank you. Okay. Well, the, the whole the whole ethanol thing is, and yeah, I'm, I'm well aware that they do use the, the the leftovers of the ethanol to to feed and, and make it a livestock feed. Um, but the the whole ethanol process is fundamentally uh, inefficient. You know, you're using this vast amounts of fossil fuel to grow corn to turn it into you know ethanol. It, it just fundamentally isn't an efficient process, even if you then again later turn it on to feed. And they probably used corn because corn is so massively grown and it's so easily a mechanized crop that we can produce. That's probably why they wanted to use it for ethanol. Um, you know, the whole ethanol thing is crazy, in my opinion. I don't know why we're doing that, but um, and there's well, lots the, of yeah. Well, the, the original idea was just that we could finally be independent, obviously, of of the Middle East and of that uh, of the of petro uh, of uh, of I'm sorry of uh, of that type of oil. So, I mean, I, I get the idea of how that started. I just I do I agree with you. It's unrealistic, and it doesn't make any sense in a world where there is food shortages to be taking food and turning that into that. Where you could have other things like hemp, um, which is a much better product for that anyway. And you you know you you would still have byproducts from hemp. Um, and you're not taking, you know, hemp out of the mouths of other people in order to turn it into uh, into fuel. But all right, let's go to uh, Joy on a wild card line on Coast to Coast. Joy. Hi there, Marjorie and Ian. I've talked to you before, Ian. You, you had a wonderful guy who came on about dirt. Ah, good. Yes. Well, glad to have you back. And I can see your what it takes to get you to call dirt or farming. I'll put you down in that category. <laughs> Uh, well, I'm on a cooperative in California. Um, we have 10 households here. <clears throat> we are attempting permaculture as as best we can do it because that's a little bit difficult. It doesn't always work that well when you live in a mountain valley. And um, and I was looking at, at, at Marjorie's okay. website. And we raise alpacas. We do the, the whole composting thing with the alpaca manure. Um we get the red worms and we turn uh, into worm compost. Just so you know, I'm out again. What? I'm sorry? And i not sure what's happened. You're out. Marjorie, are you there? I can, there you go. I can hear you fine. Yeah. You can hear Go ahead then. Uh, Marjorie, you know, I had a question about Lucena. Ah, uh, yes, Lucena. Yeah, because I'd <clears throat> heard about that years ago. And it's helping to reforest the... The rainforest. It, just just to let people know what we're talking about, Lucena is a tropical plant that's a very fast-growing tree, and you can use it in, in areas where it gets cold, but not too far north. I'd say, you know, north of Dallas, it would be very difficult, that, that sort of uh, latitude. Oh. But, of course, on the, on the California coast where it's a lot warmer and you don't have very hard freezes in the winter. But it's a wonderful, fast-growing tree, and I use it here in central Texas extensively. We had and- snow last night. Well, you know, if you have a if you have a six month growing season or longer, then you can use Lucena, and it's got a high protein leaves that you can feed to livestock. The beans are edible for humans. Uh, it makes a huge amount of biomass. You can also use the wood. I use the wood for kindling and and for carving and for steaks and and all sorts of things in the garden. And it's also a legume, so that means it naturally has that symbiotic relationship to develop nitrogen in the soil to help enrich your soil. And Lucena is an incredible plant. It's very drought hardy. There's all different kind of varieties. So it'd be wonderful through you throughout uh, you know, the southern parts of the United States and then the coastal areas where it where it doesn't get too cold. And is that is that helpful for you? Uh thank you. Let's go to uh, Mike on a wild card line on coast to coast. Mike? Hi Marjorie and Ian. Yep, can hear you fine. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Well, what got uh, me to call tonight, and I'm really excited about the topic of the show, is what I think about quite a bit, um, is do I need a gun to garden and practicing and thinking about new society? And basically what I envision, I'm kind of a <clears throat> hobbyist philosopher on this, so I envision instead of like Democrat, Republican, 
society based on like a soldier citizen sage, you know, kind of like a farmer, a thinker, um, and you know, kind of like an, a you know <clears throat> a deep thinker and a soldier. And uh, also, I was going to see what you what you thought about something like that. What it would take to buy into something like that, and uh, what she thought about as far as what gun she was thinking about is using as a standard. Because I always thought the 410 was the way to go for people who uh, lift up these societies just because the different amounts of ammo, and it's more like geared towards citizens and farming, but can be used for self-defense. Okay. Well, Marjorie, where are you on that? Well, my real short take on guns, and the thing I've noticed about most gun people is they're highly opinionated. So you're going to hear all kinds of things, and I found <laughs> them to be very helpful. So... Um, where we're at with it is the 12 gauge shotgun is the most versatile weapon out there. And if you're going to have one, one thing, that's probably it a short, short barrel, 12 gauge shotgun, short barrel. So you can maneuver around your house with it easily. You can do everything from bird shot to, uh, you know, buck shot to a slug. And it, it has a whole versatility of loads. It's kind of, it's kind of got a big kick for a woman. So, um, I tend to use the lighter loads. The other thing, uh, the 22 long rifle, it's a smaller round, but it's an excellent all-around weapon for all sorts of things. It's cheap, and the ammo is cheap. And the other thing is a 9mm handgun. Nine, half of all handguns made are 9mm. And the reason that I'm settling on these type of calibers is if you go into a small little general store anywhere, if they're going to have any ammunition at all, it'll be 12-gauge, 9mm, and 22 long rifle. Those are like the most common rounds. I suppose 308 is another one that, that some of the, the hunters use. Uh, you know, the weapons thing, there's such a... De- diversity and array. I mean, I really strongly recommend everybody go to a gun show. It's an amazing experience and probably give you a real sense of what, uh, you know, um, markets in the future will look like. <laughs> it's, it's right. Really, yeah, it's amazing. Uh, and, uh, and, and but he, he, the greater thought he had too, there, sort of he had his own vision. And I think it's fair to say, you know, as you, as the old expression goes, um, d- describe to me, what you think God is, and I'll tell you who you are, um, his vision of what that future might be would be based a little bit more on the intellectual side, that they would be given credence to the to the sages, et cetera, and that there would be a place for that in the future. Uh, uh, any thought on that? Well, I, I think everybody's going to be need to be growing food and, and probably dealing with security. And, I, I, you know, we have the luxury right now of having PhDs and, and lots and lots of thinkers, and I think that, that a whole lot less is going to be going on with that. Certainly people with good libraries and access to information are going to be, be valuable. But, but I, I, you know, I don't think we're going to have a lot of time to sit around and think there's going to be a lot more work going on, a lot more growing food, you know, a lot more checking perimeters and boundaries, a lot more taking care of, of livestock or taking care of family or, or working within the community to, to, to deal with, you know, imminent issues. So, uh, you know, I don't think we're going to have a lot of luxury for PhDs anymore or, or a lot of, you know, it's certainly going to be valuable. Uh, but I don't think a community can support somebody just to think about things. Uh, the uh, the future as uh, you see it, if you have a question for how you think you might fit into it or what you need to know more about this type of uh, farming and or cattle raising or chicken raising, uh, then this is the woman to ask. We'll get an open line for you coming up as fast as we can. Just go ahead, stand by. We'll give you the numbers or you can go online and you can link up to Marjorie Wildcraft's DVD and get the tutorial that way on Coast to Coast. This is Ian Punnett. Well, we got a full boat of calls. We'll try to get everybody on and also, if we can, get a line for you. But I don't know how we're going to get through everybody here unless we hustle between now and the top of the hour. If you missed the first hour of the show, you missed Cy Kernan from The Fix. He was talking about sustaining farming. Actually, we got into the question about do you need a gun to garden his answer to that was not in his case, although he used gun for wild game in uh, uh, France, rural France, where he farms now, uh, raising goats and making his own cheese, et cetera. But he, he did say, you know, that it, it would be almost impossible to be able to keep people out if enough of them wanted what you had. 
So putting that aside for the moment, regardless of how we think about security or for protection, we should be thinking about what more we can do to take care of ourselves and not be dependent on systems, um, be they the simple food systems that you know, may or may not run out after just a couple of days should there be a national emergency. Not bad to think about how you would get by on your own. Go find out more by linking up to Marjorie Wildcraft at coasttocoastam.com. And if you get a chance, join Coast Insider and go back and listen to that first hour with Cy Kernan from The Fix on Coast to Coast. This is Ian Ponnet. Let's start with the Skype line where we left off with Julio from Illinois on Coast to Coast for Marjorie Wildcraft. Julio? Good morning to you both. Um, Marjorie, uh, two quick questions. I'll be brief. Um, First off, uh, you talk about uh, alternatives to dentists on your website. Can you explain a little bit more, um, any alternatives to get away from the sodium fluoride and other nasty chemicals in our toothpaste? And secondly, I'm a senior in college. I'm getting ready to graduate. What could a person like me do uh, with uh, little funds to get myself prepared? And do you think, uh, should I start off with... This is uh, turning into three questions. We, we don't have that much. Food. Okay, restorable go ahead. Food. All right, so Julio's question about, uh, about uh, the, originally about dentistry. Go ahead. Great. Um, we're going to have Doug Simons out in May coming to Texas, and he'll be doing a workshop on how to do everything you need to do from cleaning your teeth to handling an abscessed tooth. Uh, we're going to be videoing that and making it available for folks that can't come to Texas. So that'll be available, and then Doug will be, be marketing it. So it'll be available. This guy lived in the wilderness for 20 years and has learned some amazing things. The second thing is start learning to grow food. Go hang out with gardeners, gardening clubs, 4-H, uh, you know, your future, uh, you will be much happier if you know how to grow food in in the coming years. That's going to be the most important skill. Uh, and uh, that'll be a good way to get started off in your new life. Let's go to the international line. Alex is in Toronto on Coast to Coast. Alex? Hi. Okay. So I'm in Canada, and um, I have a large backyard. Okay. And every summer we have a large garden. Put me in queue. Um, and so... It's, a, it's beautiful right now in the backyard, but everything's frozen. So my question is, um, when I grow things in the spring and summer, what what are the things that I can grow that are be nutritional and will, say, dry well or freeze well for the winter months? Yeah, that's a that's a great topic. Squash is one of the best ones for preserving. But all of your your most all of your vegetables, you can do something with tomatoes. Uh, you know, a survival garden is tomatoes, onions, and garlic. You can make anything else taste good with those three. Uh, and another quick thing you might not have thought about: a greenhouse is a very important component of of uh, growing food in any climate. And I was surprised even down in Central America they use it to keep the rain off the crops, but in every environment, a greenhouse is a real beneficial thing to have. I wish we had more time to go into that. Um, And and again, you know, I can't emphasize more, uh, going to your local gardening clubs and hanging out there and finding out what people are growing and getting seeds that people have grown locally that are adapted to your area. Excellent way to get started. Very good. Brian's in Colorado, wild card line on Coast to Coast for Marjorie Wildcraft. Brian? Hello, Ian and Marjorie. First, I'd like to say I'm very grateful for the Coast uh, staff, all the researchers, the producers, the phone people, the hosts, and the guests. Uh, Marjorie, I live in a little small town at 8,200 feet. There's a lot of wind. I live in an apartment. And I'm curious about uh, window plants and also about mushrooms, and thanks a lot. Yeah, excellent. Mushrooms are also another wonderful thing that you can do that don't require light. Sprouts are another thing you can do that don't require light. If you want to invest in a few uh, lights to grow things with, wheatgrass is another wonderful thing to grow in a small, you know, apartment-style environment. And with the main thing about growing the wheatgrass is you can get an incredible nutritional boost. You can make yourself a multivitamin that's far superior than anything that's manufactured and do it for just pennies a day. Uh, and my emphasis here is just to get started. Get used to that habit of having to look at your plants every day and check whether they need moisture or whether they need light, learning what it looks like when they're unhappy, when they need something or another, and, and start developing those relationships. But there's a tremendous amount you can do in an apartment. 
Yeah, start relationships with other people that are growing tomatoes and other people that are making their own cheese just so you'll have pizza, if nothing else. If you've got, if you're growing the mushrooms, somebody else might have the other ingredients. I'm all for that. <laughs> Wildcard line, Rogers in California on Coast to Coast. Roger? Yeah, hi. Um, my question is about goats. Uh, I raise goats, and, you know, they double and triple <laughs> over over a short period of time. And um, the amount of milk that you get is absolutely incredible. I just think people need to get off the cow. Um, the cows are very wasteful. They're they're hard to keep. They they uh, they eat tons of food. A goat will give you a, three goats will give you as much as a cow, and they're much easier to take care of. Uh, I just can't believe in in Western culture. You know, I guess more of American culture. People just don't know what a goat is and what they can produce. Um, and I live in the mountains, and right now I've got like three foot of snow out there, and I go out and milk in the barn, and I've got two gallons a day coming in, even now. You know, it's it's an amazing right. food source. I, right. I totally I totally agree with you that goats are, they are a far superior animal because they eat a wider variety of browse. They eat all kinds of things that, that cattle don't eat. The one problem with goats is that they do eat everything, and if they aren't managed properly, I've seen so many people completely and utterly destroy their land very, very quickly with goats. So I do highly recommend goats, but make sure that you're rotating them and you're moving them around because they do destroy the land very quickly if they aren't managed properly. But when well managed, he's absolutely right, uh, especially in, in tougher bioregions. Goats by far are going to be a much better productive animal, not only for the meat but for the milk and for clothing, for the skins, tanning the hides and being able to make clothing, which is an issue that will be coming later on down the road. Uh, wild card line, uh, Rhonda is in Oregon on Coast to Coast. Rhonda? Hi, I'm here. Yeah, Marge, I think it's great that you have this book going out. But before I get it, we started doing this 10 years ago. We plucked up ourselves up from the city and almost 11 years ago bought a farm. And, and it was based on the just-in-case factor. We don't know what's coming. But... In your book, do you cover, like, wood stoves and alternative types of ways to store, to, to process this food we have? Well, it's a DVD, just so you know, which makes okay. it a little okay. easier, too. Go ahead, uh, Marjorie. Yeah, it's a DVD tutorial, basically, on, on how we do grow food in our area, and and, and, uh, and the principles are universal, so they apply everywhere. And it also con- includes a companion CD-ROM with documents that support the video. So, for example, we have a seed saving book and a, how to make compost and, uh, you know, lot, how to tan a hide and all sorts of things that accompany it. We did not get too much into the how do you heat your home or how to do your home type thing. We are mostly organized and focused on food production. Uh, you know, heating and all those questions, security, all those are certainly valid parts. But our focus and I felt that our, our most important thing was people would want to eat. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's lots of other resources out there available. Uh, first time caller line, Derek is in Kentucky on Coast to Coast for Marjorie Wildcraft. Derek? Uh, how are you all? Thank uh-huh. you. Couldn't be better. Go ahead. Right. My question, I have two questions. Uh, do you think we'll have agriculture states like Kentucky, Nebraska, Idaho, et cetera, that will become more apt to be centers of community? And also, what manual tools would we need to have a self-sustaining farm? Oh, I like that. Really good question. Yeah. I, you know, I think agriculture is going to get smaller because as the price of fuel goes up, those big mega farms in Iowa – uh, you know, Nebraska, that they're going to be harder and harder to run. They're obviously run by mega corporations now, uh, but smaller and sustainable food areas, you know, and definitely Kentucky and Tennessee, lots of small farms there, and, and those, you know, very well may become centers of uh, more sustainable agriculture. The, the basic tools, of course, you're going to be your shovel and your pitchfork and your rake uh, and, and a good pocket knife. Those are the things that I'm always using. Um, and, and, you know, there's a, always an assortment, a gamut of tools, and that's a whole other conversation we can have. Uh, buckets and fencing, there's, there's a whole variety of things you need, uh, wheelbarrows and that sort of thing. Um, you know, I don't know how to answer that one. Uh, no, but I think that's a really good – I think that's a good question. There should be just like a basic list of the the top 30 things that you might need, and people could start, if they were interested, 
for birthday presents, for Christmas presents to start the stock? You know, I think I'll put that list together and, and put that out on the website yeah. in one of our newsletters. Yeah. 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 Well, let's go to uh, West of the Rockies. Brenda is in Washington on Coast to Coast for Marjorie Wildcraft. Brenda? Ian. Bre- Brenda? Yeah. I'm Can we here. hear you? Go ahead. I'm here. Hey, Marjorie, I'm a native Texan, but I'm living in Wenatchee, Washington now. So, hey, how's it going down there? <laughs> Texas is doing fine. Okay. Uh, I just got a couple of things I wanted to mention real, real fast and then ask a question. Uh, I watched this movie the other day. It's called Food Incorporated. You can watch it on YouTube, and it was very informative. And if that's not enough reason for you to want to make your own food, I don't know what would be. But anyway, uh, I make my own wine. I just started doing this a couple years ago, and I do my own canning also. But I would like you to touch on uh, a little bit about root cellar uh, vegetables and also bartering. And also, I'm I'm a retired nurse, and one of the things that I think people need to know is bleach is a very important thing that you need these days in case of something like this because I used to work for a plastic surgeon, and uh, we used bleach for a lot of different things that people are not aware of. It's pretty, it's pretty cheap, and you can store it for quite a while. Okay. What so would I'll you use bleach for? Well, wait, wait, real quickly, what would you use bleach, bleach for that you imagine we, need, we should have a stock of it? Infections, mostly like wounds and stuff like that. Like she's talking about wounds and stuff, you know, if you want to call a doctor or whatever. I had a dog one time. <laughs> this is pretty gory. But he, he got attacked by another dog, and the other dog chewed his you-know-what up, his private areas up. And I, I was in nursing school at the time, and I didn't have the money to take this dog to the vet. So I stuck my dog in the bathtub because I had worked for a plastic surgeon, and I knew about bleach. And I stuck him and soaked him in the bathtub twice a day. Ow! Ow! And I'm count- telling you, man, Ow. that dog healed up like you would not believe. I would not believe. But uh, knowing that area getting chewed up and then pouring bleach on it, uh, I wish... No, it's yes, a bathtub, well, bathtub of bleach water. Yeah, that'll that'll take care of it. I wish I had ear bleach. No, thank you. That, But I uh, I bet she's right. What, what about bleach uh, as far also as you're for, concerned? Also for um, water, you know, for decontaminating water. It's an excellent uh, chemical to use for that. Um Although again, you know, I, I and, and storing those chemicals are very useful. There, there's definitely a supply of. But I'm also into making sure that we have other ways to do that, using sand filters or other things to clean, or using, um, uh, you know, different plants that are also excellent antibiotics and and uh, and cleansing. But absolutely, and especially for transition years, having having a supply of those kind of chemicals is on hand is is an excellent idea. Well, and bartering, she mentioned in there too. You know, already in our community, we're starting to do that, and and um, you know, having a supply of things for for bartering. Uh, you know, uh, beans, bullets, and band aids are the classic investment for hard times and collapse scenarios. So there's the the basic idea. Nickels, surprisingly, are are. Still, probably some of the only honest money that's made by the U.S. government, and an excellent investment, even if you're on the smallest of budgets. They're three quarters nickel, 25 percent. I'm sorry, three quarters copper, 25 percent nickel, and the U.S. government is about to, uh, the mint is about to switch over to a cheaper alloy. Right now, it costs them about seven and a half cents to make one, so immediately you're making about 50 percent return on your money. Um, mm. But uh, yeah, uh, and then of course. Um, you know anything as she makes wine that's also an excellent uh bar barter or trade right. item I have, there are a lot of people we really that's all she has to make she'll never go hungry uh let's see who's uh east of the rockies is that mark in hollywood florida on coast to coast mark yes hi uh good evening this has been a very interesting uh subject um what I wanted to ask the guest is okay I have some pre existing conditions um I have high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, and coronary heart disease. In the event that, like you say, our society were to break down and the, the uh, uh, pharmaceuticals are not around to give the medicines I need to live, would herbology or uh, studying herbology in any books that are available be able to maybe address these conditions when I can't get my medicines no more? Yeah, well, one I'd say start adding, you know, extra supplies to where you have a, a, a backup supply of the medicine. And yes, there are for all of those items, and I, I don't have them on the top of my mind, but I've seen all sorts of herbal alternatives for, for all of those things. 
uh, diabetes, high blood pressure, all sorts of, of treatments. And I would say start, uh, you know, experimenting and incorporating and find what works for you. Maybe find a, a qualified herbalist and start looking for plants or things that grow around you locally that you can use. And, and also for anybody as a part of preparing is to start addressing health issues that you can heal up and, and, and clear right now before anything happens. You know, take care of your dental needs and uh, uh, start taking care of, uh, you know, all sorts of, of uh, injuries or, or things that you might have. Right. You clear them up now. Uh, last call is going to be from Patrick, and that's going to have to be it for tonight for Marjorie Wildcraft. The rest of that you're just going to have to take care of on your own by linking up to her through our website. Go ahead, Patrick. Hey, uh, yeah, non-lethal defenses for your uh, for your garden. Have y'all looked at that? I mean, I'm a I'm a pro gun person, but uh, you know, it's a lot harder to kill a person than it is an animal. Yes, we do, and we have a whole section on the DVD about protecting. You're going to have, you know, everybody's going to want your food supply, the insects, the squirrels, the raccoons, of course, the two-leggeds, uh, deer, and we do go into that in, in, in a lot of creative ways throughout the DVD. Uh, insects are something that you can eat, believe it or not, and we use dogs a lot to protect from, uh, from uh, you know, other types of predators, raccoons and squirrels, and even in, in just a small backyard situation, I would still have a small dog who is up all night while I'm sleeping, taking care of running off those critters. Right. Well, but he, I think he's talking more about, as you called them, the two-leggeds, uh, when he says, what about non-lethal responses to human interest in one's garden? Well, you know, the first, anybody who comes up to me at first, if they're asking for help, I'm going to do everything I can to help them, you know. And that's, you know, the basic of, of, you know, if I've got seeds or skills or whatever, I'm going to do whatever I can to help. Uh, and, and only if they're demonstrating some sort of aggressive behavior that I can't handle do we, do we ever want, you know, you certainly don't want to go right into lethal responses uh, uh, at, at all unless you absolutely need to. Right. Yeah. Uh, well, but I think uh, that's also something else to consider is in advance, is there something else that you can use that would keep people out of your area without having to resort to that. And it just might require a little brain power in advance. Well, to... well, one, one simple thing is, is just don't make it obvious what you're doing. You know, right. have, have your garden in such a way that it's not visible from the road or, you know, there's a stockpile of junk out in front of it so people don't suspect that there's something going on behind there. You know, and if, that, if, yeah. if that fails, dozens of rabid poodles. Why not? Pink ones. Pink ones. Uh, yeah, pink ones. That would, that would be that'd be freaky. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for putting up for the technical problems. The finest engineering minds couldn't work that out, but uh, you were great to hang in there anyway, and everybody else too. And and uh, we look forward to hearing more about. We'll keep track on these grocery prices, and we look forward to continuing the conversations. Thank you, Marjorie. God bless you and your family. Deus te amat, and I do too.